As we celebrate our 25th anniversary of 1620 The Zone, we have to start with The Godfather. Are you okay with being called The Godfather? Well, it tends to age me a little bit, but there's a whole Corleone thing that's a you know much appreciated. I could call you Grandpa Neil, but... Stay with The Godfather. Uh, but the person that came up with the idea that 25 years later is still going 1620 The Zone is Neil Nelkin. The voice, the personality, the face, well-known. If you've been in radio in Nebraska, you've had a moment with Neil. Um, let's first start, before we talk about stories and people you should or shouldn't have hired, including myself. Sports Talk Radio. You had a illustrious career. You're making your way across Nebraska into Omaha. On the East Coast, Sports Talk Radio is taking off with The Fan and other places. The Fan was the genesis in New York City, WFAN, 1050. This is before they moved to 660. So where did the idea start? Did you wake up one morning and said, you know what, Sports Talk Radio in Nebraska can work? Well, the credit really goes to uh, Marty Riemenschneider, our general manager, and John Mitchell, our owner. We had the frequency of 1180 AM and uh, really weren't sure where we were going with it. We had standards and music of your life, things like that on there. And there was a sports format in town. Fox Sports was on 1490 KOSR, the journal station at the time. And we thought uh, we could do a better job and have more fun with it and actually make more money with it on a sports talk format on one of our signals. So we built Sports Talk 1180 on Coil 1180, Sports Talk 1180, and uh, basically carried the fabulous sports babe, which was ESPN Radio's only show at the time. And they had some weekend stuff. We carried a lot of play-by-play from Westwood One and, of course, the College World Series, which we had previously had on on KCAR. And then we uh, built an afternoon show with Gary Java and Randy Ecker, who did the afternoons, I believe, from 2 to 6. And then there was a sports talk show from 6 to 7 with various personalities, Joe Nittler being one. Yeah. (laughs) There are some early names. Um. So then as you thought, you know what, let's let's expand it. 1620 is available. Let's come up with branding. What was the next step that eventually would lead to an audition with Kevin and Bob? Well, the FCC determined that 1180 was eligible for an expanded band frequency at 1620. So John Mitchell immediately went after that. So we want it. We're going to make it sports and 1620 would become our sports station. And uh, once we had that, it was KAZP. And then uh, we kind of huddled around and determined that The Zone would make a good brand for it. Named it 1620 The Zone. And at the same time, we were fortunate ESPN Radio was expanding their radio platform. Mm -hmm. And they developed a morning show with, at the time, was Tony Bruno and Mike Golick. It then became Greenberg and Golick and the ESPN Morning Show. And they started slowly adding additional shows till they had a full network. So we branded it as 1620 The Zone. We uh, applied for the call letters KOZN and uh, made it Omaha's ESPN Radio to compete with KOSR, which was Fox Sports Radio at the time. We thought we had a stronger brand. ESPN was still, at that point, the huge and only big national brand in broadcast sports. So we thought it was appropriate to establish ourselves as Omaha's ESPN Radio. All right, let's get to Kevin and Bob. Uh, Kevin was in York, Mm -hmm. um, was already on his path of this is something special. How did we ever get to Kevin and Bob? Before they got on air, how did you ever put those two together? Well, it was it was one of those things, you know, it wasn't planned. Like I say, Kevin was in York, and he was doing an awful lot of free ma- freelance. He was doing UN Omaha sports of any kind, whatever sport Omaha had, he was doing it on a contract basis. He was also doing Omaha Racers basketball, uh, and he was just whatever play-by-play needed somebody, he did it. So we thought about Kevin for an afternoon show as a possibility. And then uh, I've always believed in teams. I think teams are stronger because of mixing personalities. So I was looking for a teammate for Kevin. And out of the blue, Bob Bruce, who was doing mornings on the old WOW AM radio, Bob Bruce came in and said, hey, I want to do sports talk. And we said, well, let's put you and Kevin together on a show, (laughs) Bob and Kevin. So we did some rehearsals. Actually didn't know it, but our rehearsals were in a production room immediately adjacent to the studio where Gary and Randy were doing their show every afternoon. 
So we had all the teams in there, but they didn't know that they were auditioning for the same hours. Uh, Kevin and Bob did really well. We uh, put them on the air in the afternoon. I think it was about two weeks, and Kevin came in and quit. <laughs> he said, there is absolutely no way I can work with this guy. Bob, as you know, was yeah. a pretty aggressive personality. And Kevin said, no, I'm quitting. I'm out of here. I'll find something else to do. So being the effective manager that I am, I immediately called Mrs. Kugler and said, <laughs> Michelle, help me out here. And, and Michelle kind of talked Kevin into coming back and giving his shot. And they actually ended up being very good friends and created a pretty good afternoon radio yes. show, Kevin and Bob, on Unsportsmanlike Conduct. So as the zone evolves and you get more local programming, you have Schick and Nick, and then walk us through how... Kevin and Michael, which is kind of the standard for sports talk in Nebraska, they came about. Well, we had uh, we were looking for a morning show uh, to complement our ESPN programming. Matt Schick, who was at Channel 7, KETV, doing sports, and very well, I might add. And uh, Nick Baugh, who was a Creighton grad assistant, had played for Creighton, and was doing Creighton reports for us and helping us with our Creighton basketball coverage. And... Somehow we managed to put them together, come up with the name Schick and Nick, because I'm big into alliteration and things like that. Uh, Schick and Nick debuted and was a hit from day one. In fact, I believe we started them out with two hours and expanded them from there on. Uh, They're still going on the podcast all these many years later. Uh, Schick and Nick were an amazing combination, just like Kevin and Michael were and Kevin and Bob were. You just know when you get certain personalities together. They click, and they click really well. They were both hilariously funny, but they had different takes on everything, which made it a good chemistry. Uh, Bob decided he eventually wanted to move on. He was going through some personal issues. So we, we ran a bunch of people through the mill in terms of who we thought would work well with Kevin in the afternoon. And, of course, Kevin was the guy we had to match up with. He was our, our anchor. And Michael, who was at, uh, Michael Severe was at Channel 7, was a reporter at Channel 7. And uh, we went to the well there again and, and brought Michael in, put him on the air with a bunch of other people we tried with Kevin. But it was f- no question, Michael was far superior in terms of the chemistry. He and, he and Kevin really gelled. And we had some supporting players as well. Uh, and we had a, a number of former Huskers involved, uh, Gary Sharp and... Uh, <laughs> Christian, uh, Jason Peter. Yes. That was interesting because we had just brought you back from Fort Myers. Yeah. And uh, Jason uh, was looking to come out of the NFL and his experiences in the NFL, wanted to get back to Lincoln and wanted a radio gig. So we put, well, why not Gary and Jason Peter together, unseen, never tried anything, and put you on the radio. And that was an experience both for you, for him, and for me. And I almost quit. Unfortunately, Jason got into some issues with his NFL pension, had to move on. Uh, couldn't work for us any longer, although he loved it. At least he said so. And uh, so we went looking for another co-host once again. Who are we going to team up with Gary yeah. Sharp? And that was a challenge. Uh, it was because Damon didn't know, because he was working at OPS at the time, mm-hmm. and we didn't know each other other than familiar when back in the 90s. Um, but it never worked with each other. And Damon didn't know if he wanted to do full-time radio. Um, he liked the fill-in stuff and doing, you know, special interviews and previews and stuff like that, the betting breakdown. Uh, he didn't know if he wanted to do it. And Michael actually talked him into it. Yes. And it was, I will say this, and I think Damon would admit it, for our for less like six weeks, it was a transition because I tried to get Damon to go places that he didn't necessarily want to go and open up and be, you know, well, that's be the thing. On the air. People don't know yeah. this about Damon, but Damon is a very shy person. Uh, he is. He, he really is, is shy and doesn't yeah. like to talk about himself, even regardless of all the things he's done. Uh, he really is introverted, and it took a while to get him to come out of his shell. I credit you uh, for doing that. And, and once he came out, you couldn't stop him. Yeah. And then he became uh, very knowledgeable about radio in addition to his football and baseball yes. knowledge. Uh, people don't know about Damon and his background in baseball, but if it wasn't Husker football, he would have gone for the Husker baseball team. And uh, the thing about Damon is that he learned at the knee of Tom Osborne. Yeah. Damon's a great student and a bit of a sponge and soaked up all of the knowledge he could get from Coach Osborne and then process it through his Damon filter. Yeah. 
and when it comes out, it is incredible knowledge. When Damon tells you what's going to happen in a football game, it happens. Yep. He knows all the players, he knows all the parts, and he knows football theory probably as well as anybody I know. So we evolve into 6A to 6P, what it is now, and some extra programming as well. Why do you think 25 years later in this market, 1620 The Zone is still going strong? I believe it is the people, and I believe that any radio station, regardless of the physical facilities or regardless of the promotions, uh, I believe that... Our biggest assets walk out of the building every day, our people. We believe in in extremely capable people, not micromanaging them. We don't use any formula to run the people here. Never did. Uh, It was always, okay, this is what you do. Do it the best you can. And I like to say we ran the place with a bit of a velvet glove (laughs) in that we don't force people into silos. We let them expand into what they're capable of, and usually you get the best out of your people that way. And I think it, it's a testimony because so many of the people here stayed here for so long. All right, before we talk more about what your fingerprints are all over the station, let's talk about some of the fun stuff. What is the, the phone call from people in authority that you got about something that happened on The Zone, whether it be from the University of Nebraska or somewhere else that were like, hey, what your guys are saying on air, bleepity bleep bleep bleep. Well, you know where I'm going to go. Uh, I want you to tell this story. Yeah, we were uh, doing the sports talk in the front studio here on on 1620 The Zone. I believe it was Kevin and Michael at the time, and in the afternoon show. And and, uh, Michael had managed to get us the guest in studio. That guest was a football player who was no longer playing. His name was Thunder Collins, and he was under a great degree of pressure from the university. and, And there was a great deal of publicity, negative publicity about him and the football program. And uh, we brought him in, Michael brought him in with Kevin, and the three of them were on the air, and they were talking pretty frankly about his situation at the University of Nebraska. My phone rang immediately, and it was Chris Anderson, who was the original sports information director at University of Nebraska Athletics, and uh, basically she was a tad agitated (laughs) and wanted to know just what we thought we were doing. Well... It turned out to be one of the better interviews, although not the most positive publicity for either Thunder Collins yeah. or the football program. But it, we, we recovered from that as well. Uh, we also had some physical threats. I can recall one time, without getting too specific on names, where we had an author on the afternoon show with Kevin, and she had written a book just blistering Coach Osborne. Well, one of our owners at the time was extremely close to Coach yeah. Osborne. And uh, he was listening to this on on his way home, immediately turned his car toward the radio station, came into the station just blasting through the doors, and ran into Kevin in the hallway. And he held Kevin personally responsible for putting this woman on the air to trash Coach Osborne, who was like a father to him. And uh, he actually picked Kevin up by the collar and jacked him into the wall. And I can't remember who it was. It may have been Bob Bruce or it may have been someone else who got them separated. But it was a tense moment or two (laughs) at the time. You know, sports talk can generate emotions, and that's a good part of sports talk, but it also can generate some negative emotions too sometimes. People get passionate. What was COVID like to the zone from your perspective? Well, I thought we lost a lot of intimacy among our people because there was so much remote broadcasting from home studios, and we didn't have the eye-to-eye contact in the studio among our hosts that we were used to. But at the same time, I think COVID made everybody unite in a much more dynamic way. Uh, It did make it more personal, and I think we covered it very well. I thought, you know, with so many games being canceled and things not being played, especially the local football scene, high school football, uh, it made it difficult, but I think we survived. We uh, we did some interesting technical things, yeah. uh, trying to make sure we did cover everything that was covered. But but it was it was a tough time, no question about it. What are some of the moments which you will never ever forget about the impact of the station, either either on yourself, people that work here, the community, family, and I mean the zone family, the people that did make up the infrastructure of what this radio station was and is. Uh, So many people who became a part of it over the years, some of whom have gone on, 
uh, to other things, bigger and better things. Number one, in my opinion, is uh, a guy who does work for the NFL, does work for Fox Television, Westwood One. I mean, Kevin Kugler, play-by-play voice extraordinaire. He's on every weekend. You can find him somewhere. He did three or maybe four Olympics. I remember when he was over in Russia for the Sochi Olympics. Uh, some of the stuff he talked about over there. He's a national sports figure, and uh, he did it here at The Zone because I like to think we gave him the freedom to become who he became, allowed him to do what he wanted to do his way, which was always always what I felt was the best way to do it. I know a lot of, a lot of people believe in regulating and forcing and having meeting after meeting after meeting. I never felt that was necessary. When you get the best people, you let them do what they do best. Same thing with you, Gary. I mean, I listened to you for years, and you were with the Husker Network before you came to the— you tried to hire me. A couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But uh, I always felt you belonged on this radio station as part of the chemistry because, you know, A, you're intimate with Husker sports, but we were just getting into baseball. We were getting into uh, Creighton baseball, and in my mind, there's nobody better in baseball as far as radio is Gary Sharp. I mean, you uh, you have a baseball IQ that is beyond belief, and we felt we could tap into that. And then you became a sports talk host, and your interplay, interplay with Damon became invaluable. And, and that's where the listeners come in. The listeners so appreciated the knowledge and the depth and the background that you two brought to the radio. Uh, you can tell by the tone of the listeners when they call in. I love when you guys are on Big Red Overreaction, which can be a difficult show at times. Remember how that show got started? Remember we had a meeting? I had just started here. Mm-hmm. We had a meeting. Uh, former general manager Andy Ruback right. was here at the time. And you remember that meeting where we were trying to come up with ideas? Yeah, we had no show after the Husker Games. Now, the Husker Games at the time were on another station. But uh, we thought, or Andy thought, we should have a show that is – a response or a rebuttal to the standard, you know, the the main UNL broadcast, the 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 home broadcast, and they did a show called Big Red Reaction. Yep. I believe it was KFAB at the time. Yep. And uh, we all said, well, we can do our own show. We start it the minute the final gun is fired. We go on. It's a phone based show, but with our expert commentary from our people. And uh, yeah, uh, what are we going to call it? Well, their show is Big Red Reaction. How about we go with Big Red Overreaction? Everybody said, yeah, 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 that's it. And we did. And it was a hit from day one and still is. Uh, it's a killer show. And uh, regardless of who's hosting it, because all of our hosts are yeah. qualified to be there. But I like the fact that you mix the different personalities weekly. It's not always Gary and Damon. It's not always uh, Nick. I mean, it's yeah. other people all the time. And you mix the different personalities. Who's some of your favorite listeners? That you met that became a face. Anybody that comes to mind? The pizza guy. What's his name? Oh, uh, Pudgy. Pudgy? Pudgy. Pudgy was Pudgy was a staple of the original 1620 The Zone. Yes, he was. Pudgy had a pizza place out west. Uh, he's from Chicago and talked like yes. it. Yes. But yeah, Pudgy was great. Barry was great. Remember Barry? Yep, Barry uh, Silverstein. Both of those guys have now passed on. Rest in peace. Uh, but there were a lot of those. Our listeners became part of the fabric of the show, part of the station. And even other listeners used to listen for some of those callers. Yep. How did 1620 The Zone get the College World Series? We always had the College World Series yeah. back in the or, day. We own the College World Series, I should say. Well, that started out embryonically. Uh, the College World Series was a production of CBS Television and Radio. And KFAB had the radio rights for the finals, the final series. The local series was held by a group out of out of uh, Arkansas. Yes, Conway, Arkansas. It was called uh, I forget the name of the network, but it was a ad hoc network of stations because the NCAA couldn't get anybody to cover the preliminary games. We were at uh, K Car downtown at the Tenth and Farnham Studios, and we went after it. And we aggressively pitched the NCAA and CWS Inc. Said, we'd like to do the preliminary games. CBS will have the finals over on KFAB, but we'll do the preliminaries. We're going to go all out. We're going to do pregames. We're going to do on-field interviews. We're going to do all the things that a major radio network did. They gave us the rights, and and uh, we used to set up our booth out there at Rosenblatt Stadium inside the fenced area out front of Rosenblatt, and everybody that came by could see us and be interviewed with us, and it was a great time. Well, that just... 
became what the College World Series became over a period of time. But the good thing was we were able to get Kevin Kugler to do the broadcasts of the College World Series, where he would do 14 games in a period of eight days and showed no signs of getting tired whatsoever. And all of our other people used to do the, the, the color commentary with Kevin and the on-field reports. So when we... Was it Kevin, Adrian, and John Bishop? Right. Yeah, Kevin Adrian and John Adrian Blake Fiala and was the color commentary and, and John Bishop on the field. You're right. I've forgotten about that. Adrian has since passed on as well. Um, when we moved everything from 1290 to 1620, it was just natural we moved the College World Series as well. It has been extremely, extremely successful for the radio station. It's a trademark property for the community and for the company. And uh, uh, it's something I think we will always do in one form or another, even though there's been so many staff and technical changes over the years. But after CBS gave it up, we ended up taking the whole thing with all the games right up to the championship. And that's where Kevin got introduced to the Westwood One Radio Network because he was doing the games on their network from Omaha. And they said, hey, would you like to consider doing some college basketball? And he got the final four. Would you like to consider doing some NCAA college football? And he ended up getting college football. And then they said, what about the NFL? Kevin called me one day. I'll never forget. Called me, says, uh, Howie, the vice president at uh, Westwood One, says, uh, they're offering me an NFL broadcast. What do you think? Should I do it? (laughs) And I said, uh, well, you're crazy. This is the top of the heap in your profession. You don't have a decision here. You have simply got to do it. And, of course, he did, and the rest is history. Five years from now, this radio station in this uh, format looks like what? It's tough to say because radio is changing as as we speak every day with digital product, podcast product, and online presence. Uh, So is the sports landscape changing, much more in television than radio. But there is still a future – For sports on the radio, I happen to believe, no, I'm an old-fashioned guy, Mm -hmm. but I happen to believe the theater of the mind on radio makes a sports broadcast, especially play-by-play, much more intimate, much more personal, and I don't think you get that from an online or streaming presence like you do on radio. I want to go back. The first day that this station launched, do you remember that day? Like, what were you doing? Were you in the studio? Were you making oh, yeah. sure there was on air? I was always in the studio. Oh, yeah, you were, yeah. But uh, making sure technically we were on air. I remember the early days we had uh, one of our engineers stationed at the transmitter site so that it, just in case something went wrong, he could get it fixed right away. We were fortunate things didn't go wrong. Uh, it was a challenge every day. The biggest challenge, if you'll remember, when we put 1620 on the air, you couldn't get 1620 on most AM radios. So we had a oh. station that you couldn't hear, and we were promoting it as Omaha's sports radio station. It took a couple of years for most radios to become 1620 capable because prior to the expanded band, the AM band only went to 1600. you have any uh, memories of remotes gone bad? I have so many memories of remotes gone good. Uh, we used to do a lot of remote broadcasts. We used to send you guys to the Big Ten Championship yeah. all the time. And I think we, I think they were in Chicago back then, if I remember uh, right, and then Indianapolis. Well, the, in Indianapolis, we had a, uh, we basically had a fight on the air between hosts. Mm-hmm. They were yeah. arguing over rules interpretations. Yeah, um, and that's sports. That's what we love about well, sports. We also had, uh, and and this is to this day, and that Hooters has not been around on center. People <laughs> attach Monday Night Football and 1620 The Zone and Hooters together. We had uh, Rob Schlereth came by and did a show there one time. Uh, uh, we tried to get Dan Patrick, but we couldn't arrange the. the but we did the the, the Mike, was it Mike Schler. Who is Schlereth? What's his left first Mark name? Schlereth. Mark Schlereth. Uh, yeah, we had him out there live at Hooters and gave away free pitchers of beer during the show. It was it was quite an afternoon. Jim Rome's appearance. Jim Rome in town. Yeah. We never brought Romy in. That was KOSR. Brought him into the landmark building downtown, and it was a home run. They had him, we didn't, we wanted him, and eventually we got him when he moved over to ESPN. Colin Coward debuted here at uh, the, the uh, was it the Uptown downtown? Yeah. The apartment building down yeah. there. We did his show from there. The very first show he did on remote was from here in Omaha. 
Colin Coward on ESPN Radio. Why the transition from ESPN Radio to Fox? Well, for one thing, we were taking up more and more of the time that they wanted with our shows, and they couldn't get clearance for their shows in town. And secondly, uh, the other station, 590, made a run for them, and ESPN said, well, your contract is up for renewal. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. You've got to give us your website, we'll run it. You've got to give us a station in your cluster that we can program as ESPN Deportes, their Spanish format. So we want a station to put that on. And uh, at the time, we said, basically, uh, have a nice day. And uh, uh, we told them, no, we can't meet those terms. Rhonda Gerard and I went to the convention in Dallas, met with the ESPN bigwigs. They tried to hold us up. We refused to bend over. And so we came back and said, we can do this better. And at the time, to be fair, ESPN as a national platform was starting to get a lot of competition, not as prevalent as they were when we first started. How'd the Cubs get on the zone? (laughs) <laughs> that was a personal decision. We were a whole place was just Cub fans, and the Cubs were available. So I called Barb Pabst at WGN and said, what would it take for us to get Cubs on the radio in Omaha? And she said, you just did it. It was just that simple. No fee, no charge, no nothing. And uh, we carried the Cubs for quite a few years. And it was a fun time. It was a huge, huge success for us, especially in terms of attracting an audience, because the Cubs at the time were pretty popular in Omaha. You listen to the station today, and I know this is, and you're very humble, which you don't need to be. Um, is there something you hear that brings a smile to your face that is still your fingerprint on 1620 The Zone? Some of the liners that run. You know, I go back to the days <laughs> some of... Some of the same liners? <laughs> some of them are, yeah. Some of them been running for years. Uh, some of the recorded liners, to me, I just giggle when I remember how some of those were written and uh, what the thinking was at the time. One of my favorites, uh, and I don't think it's still running, but uh, you're listening to 1620 The Zone. Your wife and your girlfriend think it's great. (laughs) Um, Periodically it does. It's in the system. (laughs) So, yes, it does. So that is your lasting legacy. I suppose so. That's a liner that you wrote. Yeah, yeah. At the time, everybody wrote liners back then. but uh, And we had Jim Cutler, The Voice, doing those liners uh, we got jim because he was the voice of espn back then and we wanted to go after that for continuity between the network and local so we went after jim cutler and he's still today the voice of espn yes, and the voice of 1620 the zone uh and you are the godfather of 1620 the zone i think well a lot of people a lot of people well, gary yourself included well you brought me back here so well that's to my credit well i think one other quick thing about the people that are on the air the one thing that in the infancy of 1620 The Zone is there were a lot of interns that either return to work here full time or are in the media business around Omaha Lincoln. There are a lot of people on uh, on the zone tree, shall we say. Yes. I know they talk about the, the Belichick coaching tree. Well, we have a zone radio tree uh, with a lot of people in the metropolitan area. And I, I must, you know, of course, still mention uh, one gal who was a producer for Kevin and Bob in the early days and subjected herself to tremendous amounts of abuse. And we were talking about her and her future, you know, and I said, there's really not much of a future in being a radio show producer. You need to look at some additional options. I said, I would like to move you into our sales operation. I believe she was still a student at UNL at the time. Yes. And uh, we'd like to move you into the sales operation, get you trained, uh, take advantage of your knowledge and passion for the radio station because nobody has more passion. And Stacy McGilligan today is the general sales manager for this cluster, extremely successful sales management executive. But in the uh, in, in her heart of hearts, she's still an on-air personality at sixteen twenty the zone. She was our first producer on the College World Series. She was up in the booth pushing all the buttons back in those days. Um, we did have a run of producers that. Uh you have to be a little quirky to be a producer. Yes. And you have to have some thick skin, I understand, to work in the afternoons. Yes. <laughs> well, Bob used to throw things. And Bob would throw headphones. Bob would throw anything that was handy when things didn't go his didn't way. Did he drill Shane? Like he threw his headphones one day at Shane? Oh, many times. Many times. Fortunately, Shane was a relatively short stature, so most of the stuff went over his head. <laughs> and Shane is still in the business. He's producing over there at Herdat and doing very, very well. Shane was a... Uh, uh, a sp- spectacular talent. Yes. Uh, we had uh, 
And Bob named him Shane the Sports Sack. After that, it was yeah. Stacy the Sports Sack. And then uh, Kathy, I forget what, uh, Kathy uh, Pearson, I forget what the name was on the air. She had a nickname. Uh, but yeah, we've had a bunch of producers. And what I love about it is we have integrated so many women into yeah. the zone. And I always felt that was important mm-hmm. for our listeners and for the station psychology as well. Because uh, women are as passionate about sports as most guys. Stacy more so. I mean, Stacy lives and breathes. And she was instrumental in getting the Cubs because she was in a major yes. league Cubs fan. And uh, Ron Santo was her idol. And she used to go to Chicago and go to the game. She got to meet Ron Santo one day. That's awesome. uh, She came back and she has pictures upstairs of her and Santo together. Well, I appreciate this. Uh, there are a lot of stories. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of success. and A lot of people. You are a major reason why. So this well, is a great way to kick off our 25th anniversary uh, with you and, and chatting with you because this station would not exist without Neil Nelkin. Well, you're very kind, Gary. I really appreciate it. And to everybody that has ever been associated with The Zone, and that includes all of our listeners, happy, happy 25th anniversary. Let's go for the 25 where do you, where do you more. Get somebody in their 25th anniversary. You've been married. <laughs> I never made it to one of them being 25th. I mean, together, and you add them all up, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I've, I don't know what you get for the 25th. Uh, I would think maybe beer. That would do. I would do. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. It's been a pleasure. That's uh, Neil Nelkin, the Hall of Famer. He is the one that uh, came up with the idea for 1620 The Zone and guide us through everything. Uh, as our kickoff to the 25th anniversary celebration of 1620 The Zone uh, begins and continues uh, throughout the rest of the month and into the new year here on 1620 The Zone. I didn't say anything that needs to be edited out, did I?